In this video, I'd like to take a look at some of the different elements involved in becoming an effective persuader. So for this video, we're going to be looking at things pretty much exclusively from the perspective of the person doing the persuading, not the audience themselves, but, but the person doing the persuading and what things we need to consider from that perspective. So when we're becoming a persuader, there are a variety of different elements we need to look at. As you can see here, we need to think about audience analysis, organization, credibility, language, delivery, and persuasive strategies. These are all things that we're going to break down just a bit in this video and take a look at each of these individually, starting with audience analysis, because audience analysis is really where we ought to start with every persuasive effort. We need to understand who our audience is. So we need to gather information about that audience so that we can adapt our persuasive efforts accordingly. So from the very beginning, we have to have the audience in mind, know who they are so that we can, we can adapt our efforts accordingly and match up what's going to be effective with this particular audience. So we can start with what we call reflective efforts. This involves really just paying attention to the people that we're going to be persuading. If we have an, an, an opportunity to, to, to watch them be persuasive, then we can learn a lot about that, that person and what may be effective uh, for them. So if we know that our, that our audience is going to be speaking, we can listen to them and we can pay attention to, are they using lots of data or are they using lots of uh, narrative evidence or what kind of proofs of pers persuasion are they using? And then we can kind of make some assumptions about if this person's using a lot of data to try and persuade people, then they are likely persuaded by data. And that's probably why they're making those choices. So then we might want to consider incorporating more data into our presentation, or if they're using more, you know, more pathos, more emotional appeals, more narrative efforts, um, then we can, we can assume that that may be more effective with them. So we can try and reflect the efforts of the person whom we're trying to persuade by paying attention to what kind of, of persuasive strategies they use. So we can use those types of reflective efforts. We can also look at demographic analysis, which is just what it sounds like. We're looking at the demographics of the, of the audience, including a variety of different categories, uh, in, in, which you know may involve some of these age, sex, and gender, ethnic and cultural background, uh, religion, political affiliation, socioeconomic status, which is a, that combination of income, occupation, and, and education, and then group membership. Uh, so it would help us to know, is this a group of senior citizens or is this a group of fourth graders? We're going to use different strategies there, right? We're going to use different language and different references and, and different types of persuasion um, for, for groups that are made up largely of, of people of a particular age in, the, in, in a particular age range. Right? Um, or if, a, if an audience is heavily male or heavily female, that may uh, in, affect the way that we approach that audience as well, as well as all these other things. But if nothing else, and a lot of times we don't, we may have a mix of people of different ages, different genders, different uh, religious backgrounds and things, but they may all be there because of a specific reason, because they're part of a specific group. For example, if you're speaking to a, a, a group meeting of the, of the National Rifle Association or, or the local uh, parent teacher organization, you know that those people are all there for a particular reason because they share that particular passion, right? So we can use that knowledge in piecing together some persuasive strategies and some different things that we may want to approach. Now that doesn't mean we have to completely cater. If you're, if you're, if you're opposed to, you know, if you're, if you're in favor of gun control and you're speaking to the NRA, that doesn't mean you totally flip flop and say, Oh, I'm speaking to the NRA. So I have to now be pro gun, pro gun ownership and things. I can't be uh, pro gun control anymore. No, but you, but you would, you adapt your speech, right? You know, you're going into kind of the lion's den, so to speak, you know, you're, you're going to be speaking to a somewhat hostile audience, an audience who's opposed to your particular viewpoint. So you adjust your strategies accordingly, right? Based on that group membership. Uh, you know, if you're speaking to the local parent teacher organization, then you know that, that there are people who likely have kids in that school and, and have children. And so their parents and their people who are concerned about the well being of children and, and their education and so forth. So, uh, so we can use that information to kind of shape the way that we persuade, right? We can use these demographic uh, factors of analysis to, to shape and adjust the way that we persuade. We can also look at, at the needs of that audience. We can conduct a needs analysis and say, okay, where's the greatest need for this audience that I can pinpoint and that I can try and uh, persuade them in a way that helps them understand that I'm trying to help them meet that need. Right? So we can start just, for example, at a basic level with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and say, okay, what is the great need that I'm trying to, to, to serve here with this audience that I, how can I, what, what my persuasive goals are, how can I attach that to a particular need 
that may uh, exist for this audience? You know, what level of Maslow's hierarchy are they at right now with their particular needs and where can I connect to that? So we can connect a needs analysis as well. But whatever we're doing, we need to consider everything about that audience. Again, from the very beginning, the audience ought to be on our mind from the very beginning, beginning of the persuasive process and all the way through to the end, uh, through the completion of our efforts to persuade. And then even after that, as we do kind of the post analysis, we ought to be thinking about, okay, where was my audience at? Was I able to meet them? Was I able to line up my persuasive strategies with their particular uh, needs and with their goals and with where they're at? So audience analysis is going to be important at every stage of the persuasive process. Process. Another way that we can uh, attempt to, to meet the audience where they're at and find effective persuasive strategies uh, for persuading that audience is through message organization. So we look at how we arrange the material and how we arrange the information that we are uh, using to persuade that audience. So uh, we can start with things like, you know, an organization like topical organization, which is really just a way to organize something that we break it down in a way that makes sense. We're not using any other fancy type of pattern. We're just saying, okay, these are three pieces of information that I want to share with you. And and here we go. So we just jump in with a topical organization, and sometimes that can be the most convenient way. Uh, spatial organization is another possible uh, type of organization that we could use in persuasive speeches. So, for example, if I wanted to persuade people that um, Washington, D.C. no longer is the appropriate place for the uh, capital of the United States to be located, when it was originally there, it was fine because it was in the middle of these 13 original columns or colonies, sorry, as you can see here, it's in the, in the middle of those 13 colonies. That makes sense geographically. But as the United States has obviously expanded a great deal westward, it should be closer to the middle of the country, not all the way on the, on the far east coast of the country. So we ought to relocate that. Anyway, so I'm using spatial organization, which is organization uh, centered around um, the use of space and where things exist in that space. So spatial could be geographic, like east to west, like I'm talking about here with the United States. It could be top to bottom, inside to outside, so forth. But we could use spatial organization uh, in how things are arranged in space to persuade an audience as well. We could look at chronological organization, which is uh, how things are arranged in time, how things unfolded in the space of time. So how things you know, should be done in a particular order or how things uh, ex how things happened over a series of, of time, you know, starting on throughout the week, starting on Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday and so forth. Um, chronological order. We could persuade people uh, by use of that. And those are those are organizational patterns that can be used in a lot of different types of uh, of uh, information sharing, not only persuasive, but sharing information and, and explaining how to do something or whatever. Uh, a few that are really more specific to persuasive uh, efforts, though, are, for example, need plan, which is very simply where you lay out the need for a particular change or a particular policy or a particular whatever. You lay out that need and then you offer the audience a plan for meeting that need. So if I wanted to say, OK, there's you know, we need a new the need is for a new animal shelter that we have many animals that are that are underserved and they're they're roaming and that's a it's an issue not only for the animals themselves so out of the kindness of our heart for these animals we ought to be doing this but also it's an issue for our you know the, the image of our community and so forth I could lay out all these these needs, this reason why we need to have uh, an, an animal shelter in place and a place for these that we can take these animals in and care for them until we can find them proper homes. And then I like the plan. Here's how we're going to make that happen. Here's the fundraising efforts that we're going to have. Here's how this is going to be funded. Here's how it's going to be built. Here's how it's going to be run and managed and so forth. So I lay out the need and then I meet that need by laying out my plan. We could also, if, if the need is more established, now you can you can use what we call comparative advantages or comparative comparative organization. So this is only really practical if you if you have a topic where the need is well established. So you don't need to spend time talking about the need and you can really get into why your plan is better than somebody else's. So, for example, if I were running for office or whatever, and I say I have a plan for fixing Social Security, Social Security is obviously broken. We need to do something with it. Uh, there's not I mean, and most people are going to be aware of that. So I'm not going to have to spend a lot of time explaining why Social Security needs to be fixed, why this issue needs to be addressed. I can get right into what my plan is. And then why my plan is is superior to other plans that are out there, maybe specifically to my opponent's plan or whatever. Um, but I can really, you know, spend more time comparing my plan with these other plans and explaining why my plan is superior and why it would uh, why it would provide more solutions than problems and so forth. 
Finally, we can get into what's called motivated sequence or sometimes Monroe's motivated sequence, um, which is, you know, kind of the psychological process of persuasion where it, and it has these five stages. Uh, first, we, we gain the attention uh, of the audience. Then we, we establish a need, kind of like we did in need plan. We explain what the need is. Then we provide some satisfaction or some plan for resolving that need. Then finally, visual, visualization. We offer some, you know, help them see what this plan looks like in action. And then finally, um, action, what they can do to, to spur this into action, what they can do to take action here. You see this a lot in commercials and it has been a long time advertising uh, strategy. Um, you see it a little bit less so now, but back, I mean, for about 50 years, this was the standard of advertising. If you think about commercials, especially I was thinking like, Oh, like allergy commercials when they, they grab your attention with this beautiful scene, right? And this, this family's outside playing, but then you automatically see this, this person who's stuck inside looking out the window, gray inside a gray house or whatever, cause they can't go outside. And what's their need? Somebody comes over and says, why aren't you outside playing with everybody and enjoying your family and things? Oh, it's these darn allergies, right? So now I'm establishing need. What's the need for this person? They need some way to get out from under these allergies. And then their friend says, well, I used to have that problem and now I take this drug and it has cured me of all my allergy woes, right? And they say, really, does that work? And oh, absolutely. So they're providing some satisfaction there, right? Then the visualization is that we get to see this person out in the world with their family, enjoying life. And, and then finally, that's the visualization, right? And finally the action comes when it says this drug available at all local drug stores, right? And they, they say, go get yours now or call this number and, and have some delivered to you or whatever. So Monroe's motivated sequence walks us through all of these different steps and uh, can be very effective for um, pushing someone to, into action right away to pushing someone to immediate action uh, because of that action step really can be very effective in a lot of persuasive efforts. So but we can pick the appropriate organization. We can determine, okay, well, again, thinking about my audience, who's my audience, what's going to be effective with this audience. And then, uh, and then thinking about, um, what, how can I organize my information best here so that it meets the, uh, both my needs and the needs of that audience in, uh, in effectively conveying these persuasive efforts. So we can pick the right organization for our message. We can also focus on credibility. Uh, people are not persuaded by people they don't believe in, people they don't find trustworthy. So uh, credibility is incredibly important. So three things I want you to think about just real quickly in terms of credibility. Um, first of all, ethos, as we know from uh, Aristotle, is made up of, of really two factors here, and that is competence. And uh, the first is competence. Let's just focus on it. People are not persuaded by people, that they, who, people whom they don't believe knows anything. Right. They want to, to hear from people that they feel like are, are knowledgeable on that topic and competent on that topic. And, and not only that are pulling from other competent sources that are pulling in good resources from other, other, uh, solid sources. So, uh, people look for comp competence in establishing credibility. They also look for character. They want somebody who's trustworthy. They want somebody who's believable. Uh, they want somebody who they can believe in and feels like is in this for them and is really, just, you know, doing this for out of their best interests, out of the best interests of the audience and the receivers and not just their own, the persuader's own self-interest. So people, people, audiences want people who are, 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 are find more believable people who are high in competence and character. And then also we can't underscore uh, dynamism, people who are, uh, dynamic, draw an audience in, um, again, fairly or unfairly. Uh, now they can't stand alone a lot of times and not for very long. Anyway, people are persuaded by people who are dynamic a lot of times, and, but eventually we'll start to discover that they're not so competent and their character's not so solid. And that will, you know, cause their persuasion, persuasion to kind of crumble a little bit. But, but if you can combine all three of these things, competence, character, and dynamism, being a dynamic persuader, dynamic speaker, dynamic communicator, um, then, then you will really, really see your credibility uh, skyrocket in these situations. As far as language, let's think about language and the language that we use to persuade. Effective language is so critical to persuasion in a variety of ways. First of all, vividness. We create a very vivid image, a very vivid picture, very vivid sense of need uh, through language and through using the appropriate language for this particular audience in this particular situation. People want that clarity. They want that vividness in, in the scope of your persuasion and in the proof of your persuasion and everything else. So use language to create that vividness, conciseness, uh, keeping it simple. 
you know, keeping it simple. People don't necessarily want the long, complicated answer. They feel like they're being hoodwinked. They feel like they're being sideswiped there. They want the straight answer. So, you know, you should be as brief as you possibly can when you're trying to persuade. Take it from point A to point B, not point not from point A to over here and, and all scrambled up like you see in this image to get to point B, right? Take it from straight from point A to point B in as concise a way as you possibly can. Imagery is critically important in persuasion as well. This is something that I brought up in an earlier video as well. So uh, imagery, you know, we could look at this picture and say, well, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a path through a cornfield. You know, that's one way we could explain this, right? Accurately say this is a, this is a, this is, you know, wagon ruts through a cornfield. Or we could say the worn dirt path packed down from decades of faithful service divides row after row of tall corn stalks, each a part of the lifeblood that will fuel the world's food demands. Which one of those is more compelling, do you think? We can use that imagery to really describe a scene, to really pull an audience in. Now, I know this kind of counteracts conciseness. We got to pick and choose our spots. Not every part of our persuasion should be this wordy, but when we're trying to create a picture, trying to convey some imagery, it's absolutely crucial. Okay. Uh, next, figures of speech. We can use figures of speech. We can use simile and metaphor and alliteration and hyperbole and so forth. Appropriately use those things um, to, to engage an audience and to, to, to really um, pull them into those persuasive efforts. And we can use humor when appropriate, and, and we can use it appropriately to, to, again, engage an audience, to increase our dynamism and to, to just, you know, enhance our persuasive efforts. So language can help us do each of these things. And so we need to, to carefully consider our language in our persuasive efforts. When we think about delivery, there are a couple of different elements of delivery that we need to consider. Um, first, nonverbal. Uh, there are a couple of different nonverbal elements here that are that are really important to uh, persuasive efforts. Um, posture is really important. We need to, to enhance, you know, a confident posture, not some withering, you know, like we're we're ashamed to be there or we're we're trying to hide from the audience. We need to have this confident posture uh, that exudes that we know what we're talking about. I have the competence, I have the character, I have the dynamism, I am confident, I am here, and I'm, you know, sure of what I'm saying, and you should be sure of it too. That's what posture can do for us. We need to, to maintain eye contact. You know, again, uh, cautious not to do so in a creepy way, but, uh, you know, we don't just want to stare at one audience member or whatever, but we need to use eye contact appropriately and effectively in these types of situations. And then there's a way that we can use movement and gestures too. You, you may have noticed if you've ever seen a TED talk, they have those red kind of carpets or, or dots on the stage. That's really so that the, the speaker knows where they can speak um, within that range that they can move around though uh, and move from side to side, move a little bit. Now again, pacing is not good. We need to control our movements, but if we have planned movements, we can use that effectively to demonstrate to uh, audience and to enhance our, our delivery and to demonstrate that confidence in the audience or to the audience. Uh, when we think about verbal delivery, again, we need to choose our language carefully. We also need to, um, you know, speak at the appropriate level for that audience. Again, choosing language, using language effectively and appropriately, uh, and using language that's appropriate for that topic, uh, making sure that we choose our words carefully. So verbal delivery is also critically important in establishing the confidence of the audience there. And then we need to think about our channel you know, our channel for, um, for, um, communicating with that audience is, is what's going to be the, the most effective way for us to get our message across. Do we need to, to uh, do so uh, verbally face to face or would an email suffice? Should we create a video? Should we be using a podcast? There are different ways that we can reach audiences, um, and different ways that we're more likely to get our message across. So we need to consider all of these things when we're uh, seeking uh, to consider the best method of delivery as well. Finally, I'd like to look at some different persuasive strategies with you. Just a couple of these. There are lots of different, but I just picked a couple of the major persuasive strategies that, that uh, people find effective and that we can consider. So the first is what we call the yes, yes technique, which basically says that we want to get the audience started in the right direction by getting them to say yes before they have an opportunity to say no. You don't want to start with a no. You want to get them started off with a series of yeses. So one uh, example of this that, that I think is very appropriate uh, is uh, involves a man that you probably won't recognize from his picture here. This is a man named Henry and, uh, and Henry 
Gates is not a, a household name, except except that he is. His last name is actually. Uh, and this is Henry Phillips. And you may not know who Henry Phillips was, but uh, but Henry Phillips was just this, this salesman who had a lot of confidence. And he ran across this person who had developed this product that he really thought was going to change uh, the world, but was having trouble getting anyone to, to believe in it and to, to say that they would manufacture it because it was a very difficult manufacturing process, not something that had ever been done before. Um, so this this Henry just happened to run into this person and and uh, he, this person had just come off his latest round of no's and was feeling pretty down about it and was ready to give up. And Henry asked him about his product and they got to talking and Henry said, well, you know, uh, I'll take a shot at it if you want to sell me your patent. The man had a patent on what he had created. And the guy said, yeah. He, and so Henry Phillips brought the, bought this patent for for a song, really. I mean, very, very low price considering the impact that it would have on the world. Uh, but you see, for Henry Phillips, uh, one of one of the things he was fond of saying is that a no is just a yes to a different question. So when Henry went and took this product to the same company that this this other man had just gotten a no from, he went in and talked to the president of the company because he wouldn't take no for an answer. He finally got in to see the president of the company. And the president of the company said, uh, said, I don't think this can be done, but it's, and Henry said, well, let me meet with your engineers. And the engineers met with him. He said, look, we just looked this over with this other guy. We told him it's not possible. And, uh, and so they said, no. And Henry said, let me, let me ask you this. Do you like having a job? And they said, yes. And he said, do you think that it would be effective for you to keep your job if you could make a product that nobody else would make? And they said, well, yes, obviously. And he got him saying several yeses. And then finally he said, so wouldn't this be a good product to do that with? And they said, well, yeah, it would be, except you can't, it can't be done. And he said, well, no, you just told me yes a bunch of times. It can be done. So let's do it. So they went back to the drawing board and they came up with a whole new process to create this product, um, which happened to be a, an issue that people were having. They couldn't get the screw to stay on. It couldn't get this, the, the, the screwdriver to stay on. Say it. Henry Phillips had bought the patent for the Phillips, what became the Phillips screw head. Okay, well, and he hadn't developed it, but he bought it. And he's the one who sold it and he's the one who get, brought it to creation. So we know not only the Phillips screw because of Henry Phillips' efforts and his refusal to take no for an answer and, and his effective use of the yes, yes technique, getting people to say yes, 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 until they said yes to the question he wanted them to say yes to, which may have previously been a no. So now we have the Phillips head screw and the Phillips screwdriver, which you can uh, imagine bears his name and bore him uh, pretty good financial success as a result as well. So we can use the yes, yes technique. We can get people headed in the right direction by asking them some questions to which they say yes to. Okay. We can also use the don't ask if, ask which. Sometimes we give people too many options, then we get a lot of answers we don't want, or they get frozen up and locked up and, and can't really decide. Uh, so you get this a lot with kids, for example, when you ask them, you know, what do you want to have for breakfast? And then you'll get every answer from, you know, pizza to, uh, to, to cereal, to, to whatever. I mean, exotic things they can come up with in, in their mind, green eggs and ham and so forth. So instead of asking, what would you like for breakfast? Sometimes it's a better idea to say, would you rather have pancakes or waffles this morning? Or would you rather have cereal or toast or so forth, right? So give them some options. So we, we don't ask the audience if they want something. We ask them which one they want. You know, that can be effective as well. Don't ask if, ask which. We can seek a partial commitment um, where people say yes to part of it, where, where they may say yes to a free trial, for example, and they've already taken that first step. That's a partial commitment, right? Or if they clip out a coupon, that's a, that's a partial commitment. They take a flyer. That's already a partial commitment. They're already halfway there. So once we've got that partial commitment, then we've already moved them. We've got the momentum going to move them toward where we want. So we can take them step by step and that can be an effective uh, strategy as well. And then finally, we can ask for more and settle for less. Ask for more and settle for less. You see this all the time. Uh, stores will have these big sales, right? And everything's marked down. And and you think, oh, wow, it's 40% off. Oh, my goodness. Well, what they don't tell you is that they already raised the price by 50% of the original and then dropped it by 40%. So they're still making 10% more than they would have otherwise, right? We can do that too. We can kind of anchor and contrast. Ronald Reagan was, was famous for doing this in his negotiations with the Soviets. He would go in and say, uh, when they were talking about nuclear missile disarmament, right? He would say, I want a hundred percent of this category gone. And that's what he would tell the Soviets. You know, in advance, he would tell his, his advisors that he wanted them to cut back at least 25%. That would be his goal. I want to eliminate at least 25% of this range of, of nuclear weapon, and uh, I'd be satisfied with that. So he went in, though, and said, I want them all gone. I want 100% gone. 
So when the Soviets came back and said, well, we can't do that, but we'd, we'd be willing to look at 50%. And he'd say, oh, okay, I guess so. We'll take 50%, which is really 25% more than he hoped to get in the first place, right? So that's a win. Anchor and contrast, you ask for more than you want, and then you, you sort of, quote unquote, settle for less than that. Okay? We can use those types of persuasive strategies uh, as well with great effect. You know, the biggest thing I think in, to keep in mind as a persuader is this. A goal without a plan is just a wish. If you have a goal as a persuader, you're trying to accomplish something as a persuader, you need to have a plan. You need to have all of these things thought out, not just one of them. We need to think about audience analysis. We need to think about our delivery, about our language, about which persuasive strategy is going to be effective for you. We need to have a plan for all of these things. And then we need to have a plan B and maybe even a plan C for these things. Uh, because, uh, you know, you never, you know, uh, Mike Tyson, the famous boxer said, everybody has a plan until they get hit, right? Once you get hit as a persuader, what's your other plan? How else can you approach this? So we need plan after plan after plan in mind uh, if we're going to reach that goal, because without it, we're just wishing. If you have a question about, you know, any of these persuasive strategies and what you can do to be a more effective persuader, don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to hear from you via email and chat about persuasion with you at any time. So in the meantime, get out there and think about what you can do to be the most effective persuader that you possibly can.